Hello, my name is Betty Sargent, and I am honored to introduce the extraordinary Frank Rose, who knows just about everything there is to know about storytelling. His most recent book, The Sea We Swim In, How Stories Work in a Data-Driven World, has been named one of the best nonfiction books of the year by the Next Big Idea Club. And with good reason, as you can see, from the many rave reviews the book has received. Frank is a master storyteller himself. In fact, he teaches strategic storytelling at Columbia, where he is also awards director of Columbia's Digital Storytelling Lab. He has been a contributing writer at Fortune, a contributing editor at Wired, where he started concentrating on media and technology way back in the early aughts. Frank quickly began to realize that storytelling is no longer what it used to be, that digital technology was changing the way we tell stories, making them nonlinear, participatory, and immersive. Frank, in Frank's words, Digital technology changes the way we tell stories and the way we respond to them. It allows for an interplay between author and audience that didn't exist in mass media. It blurs the line that made most of us passive receptors for more than a century. And why does this matter? Let's let Frank tell the story. It's breathtaking. And I promise it will change the way you think about the power of stories forever. Thank you. I'm uh, uh, going to uh, obviously do a little talk uh, about my book today. I'm going to sort of uh, actually intersperse uh, um, brief readings with uh, a little, uh, little conversation, uh, a couple of observations at least. And uh, so feel free to uh, break in at any point if you have questions or comments or whatever. Uh, and I thought I'd start by explaining that quest, the, um, explaining the title, The Sea We Swim In. Um, it's not uh, immediately obvious, uh, which was kind of the point. But one of the people that uh, sort of um, inspired me when I was writing this book and inspired the Columbia program that I lead. Uh, it's an um, executive education program in strategic storytelling. And uh, one of those people was Jerome Bruner. Uh, as you may or may not know, Bruner was one of the leading psychologists of the 20th century and in, well into the 21st. Uh, he was a leader of the um, cognitive revolution against behaviorism at Harvard in the uh, in the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, and at a certain point in the mid 80s, he came interested in stories and storytelling. And he took the position, which was quite radical at the time in psychology, he took the position that stories were actually worth studying. They weren't, you know, frivolous entertainment, which is what most psychologists had just sort of assumed, uh, that they actually said something about us. And uh, this was the beginning of yet another revolution, uh, something that's called the narrative term. So I have um, uh, two quotes at the beginning of the of book, um, epigraphs. And uh, the first is from Bruner himself. He said, we live in a sea of stories and like the fish who, according to the proverb, will be the last to discover water, we have our own difficulties grasping what it is like to swim in stories. So, um, Bruno was a great thinker, but um, there are other writers who are perhaps a little more um, uh, fluid. And one of them uh, certainly is David Foster Wallace. So I found this quote from David Foster Wallace um, he gave a commencement address at Kenyon College in 2005. It was the same year that um, Steve Jobs gave his uh, 
quite justifiably famous commencement address at Stanford. And uh, Wallace, his idea was to talk about um, the value of a liberal arts education, which is what these people had been getting, presumably. Uh, but he um, told a little joke at the beginning. So the joke goes, there are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming in, uh, in, uh, the, swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning, boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then one of them turns to the other one and says, what the hell is water? Uh, so uh, what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do here is uh, they're basically you know sort of unfolds in three parts, and uh, the point of the point that I want to make is uh, first how stories have worked in the past, and um, second where they're taking us uh, in the future, and so I'm going to start with. Um, the actually the very beginning of the book, which is kind of personal, um, the preface where I talk about some of my own experiences. When I was in high school, I lived on the outskirts of a small city in Virginia. Our house was out in the country on a hill above the, where, uh, above the valley where the Blue Ridge meets the Alleghenies. I was an only child. Sometimes at night, I would go outside and gaze over the woods and pastures of the city down below. It was a railroad town, home base of the Norfolk and Western, the line that brought coal down from the Appalachian mining camps and hauled it out to the sea. You could see a lot of lights down there, street lights, store lights, house lights, electric ev evidence of human activity. And though I couldn't see them or feel them, I was also acutely aware of the signals that were flying through the air. Radio waves from the city's two television stations, carrying information from other cities far beyond my view. I knew then that I wanted to be where the signals come from, not where the signals went to. So I did the only thing I could think of to get started. I volunteered for the school paper. It, I was painfully shy back then, and I figured if nothing else, it would give me an excuse to talk to people. So, uh, true story, I was perhaps a little weird as a kid, uh, <laughs> but, um, but I, you know, the, I've always tried to uh, maintain that sense of wonder. You know, I think it's really important in a writer, but it's really important in anybody. And, um, you know, just never to take anything for granted. And so that's, um, kind of what I've tried to live by as a journalist, which is how I, uh, you know, which was my profession for most of my career. And I still do to a certain extent. I write for the uh, Times and the Wall Street Journal on occasion. Um, but uh, uh, it's also true that I was painfully shy and uh, yet um, um, at a certain point um, I, began, you know, when I got to New York after graduating from college, uh, I first off started writing about the punk scene at CBGB and so forth for the Village Voice. Uh, and then um, I started writing for Esquire about sort of strange subcultures like uh, New Wave and the Pentagon, bureaucrats in the Pentagon, Christian surfers in Southern California, tech entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, which was still in the early 80s, uh, you know, kind of not quite in its infancy, but certainly not what it is now. Um, and, uh, you know, along the way, I realized that um, reporting on business, you know, business was sort of like the strangest subculture of all. And um, so I got kind of uh, waylaid by that and also technology. So I ended up um, writing a lot about technology, uh, one of the um, first, uh, you know, magazine journalists to do so. And um, then at, in 1999, I was invited to join the staff of Wired magazine, uh, which was great. I loved Wired and um, I felt, you know, my, my beat, so to speak, was going to be what was happening at the intersection of business and technology. And uh, so I thought, this is great. You know, this is like 
you know, all along I've been, you know, bouncing around from business to technology to, you know, all these other things. And now it's all coming together. It's like there was a plan to begin with. But then I realized that I was narrativizing the whole thing. There was no plan, if I was being honest with myself. Uh, you know, <laughs> I just stumbled into it. Uh, it happened to be a very felicitous uh, thing to stumble into. Uh, but the you know, real reason I was offered this job, I suppose, was because two years earlier when we were, my wife and I were moving downtown, uh, I got a call from the uh, then editor of Wired Magazine uh, asking me to, if I could write this um, cover story for her in like two weeks. She needed something immediately. Uh, so I looked around at all the boxes and stuff in, in the apartment and I said, yes, <laughs> you know, please. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, so, uh, this was not um, immediately popular in my household, but um, I was prepared to live with that. <laughs> and uh, uh, so the um, the upshot was, uh, you know, two years later, I get uh, I get offered this job. So uh, you know, there's a lot of randomness involved, is what I really want to say. And yet we are uh, constantly trying to find the narrative and things. In his book, A Black Swan, uh, Nassim Nicholas uh, Taleb calls this the narrative fallacy. You know, the idea that there's a story behind everything. And yet, uh, the narrative fallacy is with us all the time. Uh, we, we need a narrative because otherwise we're flying around in chaos. And what narratives do, what stories do, is really provide a structure. Um, for our lives, for our beliefs, for, uh, you know, everything that, um, that we encounter. We're able to, um, you know, <laughs> with, uh, you know, more or less ease, we're able to, uh, you know, sort of fit these things into a narrative and kind of make sense of them all. Uh, so, um, another just um, a brief um, autobiographical note. Um, well, semi-autobiographical. I read an article in the New Yorker a while back in which the writer started to wax on about the Greek philosophers. Appetites we share with animals, he wrote, summarizing Socrates, reason is what makes us human. Well, sure, reason to the extent that we employ it does appear to be uniquely human, but so are stories. Man is a storytelling animal, Graham Smith wrote in Waterland, his meta-novel about a history teacher whose students are bored with history. Wherever he goes, he wants to leave behind not a chaotic wake, not an empty space, but a comforting marker voids and trail signs and stories. As long as there's a story, it's all right. So two things are going on here, I'd say. Uh, one is the assertion that stories give us patterns. They comfort us by helping us make order out of chaos. The other has to do with that word animal. Storytelling may be unique to humans. It's uh, difficult, though hardly impossible, to tell stories with that language. But stories are a product of our animal instincts. They have little to do with reason and everything to do with emotion. Reason has always been an aspirational goal. When humans lived more like other animals, architecture, language, and religion, sure, but no electricity, no air conditioning, no jet travel, no germ theory, no anesthesia, no indoor plumbing, no flush toilets, no horses to take us places, shit everywhere. Those who could afford it took great pains to raise themselves above the barnyard. Reason did the trick, so did exquisite clothing in satin and lace, which cost more in pecuniary terms but far less in mental effort. Now we exist by the billions in 24-hour high-tech cocoons, wearing young or old, rich or poor, some combination of worn jeans, uh, t-shirts, and designer sneakers. We don't have to worry about what separates us from the animals anymore because the iPhone makes it obvious. <laughs> we can finally relax, maybe not completely, but at least enough to think about what's going on with stories. So that's what I want to do tonight, and that's what um, I, uh, that's what the book is about, of course. Uh, so 
Hold on, just a moment. My um, my next um, section that I want to read is um, is also autobiographical, uh, sort of more about my family and the past and where I come from um, and where that has uh, taken us, um, which is um, well, you'll see. Often the most effective stories don't register as stories. They're just the way things are. Growing up in Virginia, which my mother's family has called home since the 17th century, I never thought to wonder about the Confederate statue on the courthouse lawn or the larger than life statues of Confederate leaders on Richmond's Monument Avenue. They were just there. Not until African-American activists started targeting such statues a few years ago did I see them for what they are, part of a large-scale effort to rewrite the history, the story of the Civil War. Usually the victors write history, but in this case, Southern white states a remarkably successful campaign to rebrand the Confederacy. Instead of an insurrection led by slaveholders bent on preventing Abraham Lincoln from, quote, annihilating in effect property worth thousands of millions of dollars, as future Confederate President Jefferson Davis put it in early 1861. The war was transmuted after the surrender at Appomattox into the lost cause, a doomed yet noble campaign to preserve a way of life marked by chivalry and crinolines. Instead of a pecuniary defense of property rights, it became a principal de defense of states' rights. The war between the states, as my mother used to pronounce it, became the war of northern aggression, a fight to preserve an agrarian way of life against a rapacious, industrialized north. Slavery in this telling was a strangely benevolent institution and not the real cause of the war in any case. The tale was told across many media, as tales so often are. It reached its apogee in the 1930s with the release of Gone with the Wind and the publication of Douglas Southall Freeman's worshipful four-volume biography of Robert E. Lee. Freeman, who lived in a white columned plantation revival mansion in Richmond's West End, is said to have saluted every time he drove past the Lee statue on Monument Avenue. But long before that, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, the UDC, sprang forth to memorialize Confederate valor in stone. The Ku Klux Klan had been stamped out by 1871, but in 1915, D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, the first historical epic on film, the first American blockbuster, the first, Amer the first movie to be screened at the White House, a film that lampooned freed slaves for eating fried chicken on the state house floor and demonized them for daring to sully white womanhood. This sparked the KKK's re rebirth in North and South alike. The regeneration took place on Georgia's Stone Mountain, which the UDC with the support of Klan leaders set out to transform into a Confederate memorial. For blacks, lynch law prevailed. Black bodies dangling from trees, hanging from bridges, strung up in the town square. The practice was championed by such upstanding citizens as Atlanta newspaper editor John Temple Graves, a Stone Mountain enthusiast who, in a public lecture at Chautauqua, New York in 1903, hailed lynching as, quote, the sternest, the strongest, and the most effective restraint that the age holds for the control of rape. Blacks, Graves de declared, are creatures of the senses, and with this race and with all similar races, the desire of the senses must be restrained by the terror of the senses. But for whites, or at least white Protestants, the bitter enmities of the Civil War were fading away in a, recon in a haze of reconciliation. On the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, which had resulted in some 46,000 casualties, over three days, veterans from both sides converged in a, on the small Pennsylvania town for a reenactment that was marked not by uh, um, animosity, but by handshakes. As the title card in The Birth of the Nation put it, the former enemies of North and South are united again in defense of their Aryan birthright. Stories have been weaponized throughout history. Only by understanding how they work 
how they can prey on the emotions, can we create better stories to counter them? Uh, so, it's only recently that I realized that the name of this man, uh, this author and newspaper editor who saluted Robbie Lee on the way into uh, town every day, his name was Freeman. His name was Douglas Southall Freeman. And he uh, saluted General Slave Owner uh, every single morning that he drove in. Uh, you know, when for somebody who grew up like me, that statue was not threatening at all. It was noble. It was, uh, you know, on its 40-foot plinth, you know, the, the size of a four-story four building. Uh, that's how high it was. That's where the horses' hooves were. Um, you know, it was, it was something to literally look up to. But if you were viewing it from, you know, sort of another perspective, you might see uh, a, a man on horseback in uniform and you're on foot uh, beneath him. So um, this kind of thing was, um, well, it came to a, it, it came to a certain point uh, when I was visiting, I was with my parents and I was, I think I was in my senior year in high school and I was visiting um, my, uh, with my parents, I was visiting my mother's cousin at the family homestead, which was called Ingleside in Bedford County, Virginia. And uh, Ingleside was, uh, you know, it looked like a modest two-story um, frame house, uh, farmhouse on this winding country road at the very foot of the Peaks of Otter. Um, but uh, if you look closely, you might realize it was actually a two-story log house. It had very small windows. It had very thick walls. And between the clapboards on the outside and the plaster on the inside, it was all logs. Uh, so we, um, we sat there and we, we chatted with my 80 something year old, um, you know, my mother's 80 something year old cousin uh, for some time. And then she said, um, uh, she, you know, maybe I'll read you something from one of the family wills. Well, I thought, this is great. It doesn't get much better than this, right? Uh, family will. Um, so, you know, I was ready to go outside, but I stuck around and um, she pulled out some will from the 1840s, I think. And, uh, you know, I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention until she got to the point where she said, uh, and I bequeath my Negro man, John, to, um, and uh, that changed my perspective uh, forever. Um, that was a cold chill running down my spine. It was the first time that I realized fully what we were actually talking about here. You know, it's very easy to, um, it's very easy to kind of forget all of that and just go along with the story that we've heard. So then I went off to, to uh, college, which by the name, by the way, was named Washington Lee. It was named after, of course, Robert e. Lee, who was the president of it after the Civil War. So, um, I'm going to, um, now I'm going to read a, a slightly longer um, passage because I want to talk about um, where stories are taking us now. And um, that's obviously uh, sort of a, you know, it's an issue, shall we say, for a lot of people. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with the rise of digital technology and in particular social media. We feel that uh, stories have gotten totally out of control because, uh, you know, anybody can post anything on social media. And to a certain extent, that's true. But uh, there's also, um, you know, we shouldn't forget, there's also, uh, you know, um, television networks, um, very powerful, very popular television networks that um, promulgate stories that uh, maybe don't have a whole lot to do with the truth. Um, now, one of the, uh, I'm, I'm going to first off talk briefly um, in this excerpt uh, about The Art of Immersion, which was my previous book. And 
I should um, maybe explain that one of the people, one of the writers that really, uh, you know, that, that really spoke to me when I was writing this book was um, David Shields. And he had just published a book called Reality Hunger, um, which I just thought was wonderful. And in Reality Hunger, he talked about the birth of a new artistic movement, which was um, you know, marked among other things by um, a reader slash viewer participation and involvement, um, by a thirst for authenticity coupled with uh, a love of artifice, and by, as he put it, uh, quote, a blurring to the point of invisibility of any distinction between fiction and nonfiction, the lure and blur of the real. And this blur is kind of has become a recurring theme of mine. So that's what I'm going to start off with. Ten years ago in The Art of Immersion, I wrote about a speech by Philip K. Dick called How to Build a Universe That Doesn't Fall Apart Ten Days Later. Dick was saying he actually likes to build physical universes that fall apart because then he gets to see how the characters respond. Also because he has, quote, a secret love of chaos. But what happens, I wonder, when the universe that digital media spins for us begins to fall apart, as inevitably it will. It's not just the characters that have to respond, it's us. How do we cope when the fictional bleeds into the real and vice versa? How do we handle the blur? Well, moving into the present, now we all know. So far, at least, with an ineffectual mix of hysteria and denial. And I have to wonder, what have these new forms of stories gotten us? Where are these new forms of stories taking us? Um, I was in Los Angeles one day when I found myself in a large conference room at USC's Robert Zemeckis Center for Digital Arts, a nondescript white box of a building just down the street from the university's, university's palm-studded park-like campus. If there are people who can tell us where these new forms of stories are taking us, I figured they ought to be here. Seated around me were the half dozen individuals who run the futuristic research projects at the Entertainment Technology Center, a think tank funded by every major Hollywood studio uh, and by tech and telecom companies like Cisco, Microsoft, and Verizon. Um, Philip uh, Lelleveld, who heads um, ETC's Immersive, uh, immersive uh, Media Initiative, uh, said uh, in this meeting, um, you're going to have a narrative story, but also a new type of immersive experience. Um, now, Lelleveld was focused on, uh, his Immersive Media Initiative was focused on virtual reality, augmented reality and mixed reality, known collectively as XR. Uh, an experience is not directed or edited, he went on to say, that lacks quick cuts or close-ups, that may boast a 360 degree field of view, and that provides not just visual and auditory stimulation, but sparks the other senses as well, touch, temperature, taste, smell. People say, the story emerges after you have the experience, he said, as in a game but with a twist. The ultimate goal is effectively to have multi-sensory input that you can't tell what is real and what is virtual. The blur again. I was starting to wonder about this whole immersion thing. Seated at my left was Eve Bergquist, who heads ETC's AI and Neuroscience in Media Initiative. Most of ETC's top people are old Hollywood hands, which gives them credibility with the studios, as well as insight into how the studio people think. Lolly Veld is a former vice president at Disney. Bergquist, tall and lean in his late 40s, sporting a haircut that looks expensive, expensively shaggy, could easily pass for a Hollywood player, but his background is different. A decade and a half ago, he was Alexi Debat, Middle East expert and on-air consultant for ABC News. Then, in 2007, it came out that he had made up large parts of his personal story, that he had falsely claimed a PhD from the Sorbonne, 
uh, that he had exaggerated the position with the French government and apparently faked interviews with then Senator Barack Obama and other leaders. His news career suddenly over, he quickly dropped from view. Former associates suggested that he sell his story to Hollywood. Instead, he resurfaced a few years later as Eve Berkquist, which was his own middle name coupled with his wife's family name, data and analytics expert and CEO of Novamente, a small firm pursuing general purpose artificial intelligence. After a couple of years of unpaid consulting for ETC, he joined the staff in 2018. By this time, he says, I realized that the entertainment industry was a great opportunity for AI. He may well be right. Backing up a little bit, nobody knows anything. That was William Goldman's take on Hollywood. Goldman, of course, was the screenwriter for two Oscar winners, All the President's Men and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, as well as Marathon Man and The Princess Bride. This pithy observation was the first sentence of his 1983 memoir, Adventures in the Screen Trade. And it has been trotted out weekly, if not daily ever since by producers and directors and presidents of this or that of motion picture studios and the television networks by the people who are supposed to know something, in other words. Except they can't because nobody does. Uh, Disney's um, Frozen, Disney's Frozen became a global hit to the surprise of everyone. Solo, a Star Wars story, lost an estimated $77 million, the first bomb in the 40 plus year history of the franchise. Goldman penned the fundamental axiom of Hollywood. Berkquist hopes to disprove it. My team and I are well on our way to understanding the cognitive relationship between stories and people. He, he told me one afternoon as we sat in the Hollywood Boulevard coffee shop. We are chasing a mathematical theory that would explain what kind of uh, narratives would drive what kind of behavior. A quantitative theory of interestingness, he called it. Everything the human mind finds interesting, he said, movies, songs, people, everything, has a similar ratio of things that we know and things that we are new. The human brain is optimized for novelty, but too much novelty and it's overwhelming. Boring. That's why Philip Glass doesn't sell millions of albums. <laughs> and that applies to everything. People would click a lot more on a flat earth video because if you're in a round earth society, which let's face it, we are, um, flat Earth is a novelty. Uh, in parens, I say researchers have found YouTube to be behind a surprising uptick in flat Earth sentiment in recent years. Armed with this in insight, he adds, we are developing a tool that can score the interestingness of anything based on familiarity and novelty. The tool is called Corta. Uh, and in its early rough form, Berkeley said, uh, Corto could predict the success of a song with 98% accuracy. Movies and television shows are a lot more complicated, but uh, by 2020, Corto had a database of 220,000 titles, each of which could be scored and compared with the others uh, on the basis of narrative structure, emotional tonality, the emotional arc of characters, color scheme, and a host of other characteristics. Type in Pulp Fiction, for example, and Corto will tell you that its characters are aggressive, anxious, artistic, body-focused, food-focused, friends-focused, sex-focused, family-oriented, uh, work-oriented, and melancholy, but, uh, with extreme, but extremely low on agreeableness happiness and social skills. <laughs> Corto thinks Amazon's The Man in the High Castle series, based on the novel by Philip K. Dick, is quite close emotionally to Nancy Drew and uh, Sherlock. <laughs> Bertquist is careful to frame Corto as a helpful tool for screenwriters, directors, and producers, not as a threat to their artistic freedom. 
It gives the content creators a lot of signals, he says. We're trying to bring neuroscience to what is fundamentally a neuroscience problem, which is storytelling. Understanding stories is a lot like understanding physics. It's the world around you, which is certainly something that, uh, um, uh, that um, Jerome Bruner would have said. These two initiatives from ETC, Berkowitz's work in AI, which aims to replace uh, guesswork with certainty, and Philip Lowryville's work in XR with its ultimate goal of erasing the boundary between what's real and what's virtual. They recommend that, uh, represent the twin directions in which di digital media are evolving. On the one hand, toward the elimination of uncertainty in advertising, in screenwriting, in any field that requires buy-in from an audience. On the other hand, toward the blurring of reality to the point where it becomes almost impossible to say what is, uh, what is certain and what is not. So that's, uh, I think, where we stand now. Um, we are, you know, if you look at what's happening with, say, Google and Facebook, um, you find that um, they offer certainty, or the illusion of certainty, I should say. They offer the illusion of certainty to advertisers. They follow us around the web. Uh, and uh, what they're really selling is uh, their predictive abilities, their ability to predict what we're going to do next. Um, they uh, say that, uh, oh, this data is anonymized and you know, nobody cares about you personally, which is precisely the opposite of the truth. Uh, they care immensely about each of us individually and personally, um, because that's what they're selling to um, that's what they're selling to their advertisers. Um, it's worth noting that um, between them, Google and Facebook control um, over 60% of the uh, of digital advertising in the United States. Um, that leaves, uh, and Amazon is um, rapidly gaining ground, uh, not at their expense. Um, so as of about a year or so ago, Amazon had 7% of digital advertising. So that means that, uh, you know, two thirds of advertising goes to uh, three of the world's largest and most valuable publicly traded corporations, um, which happen to be headquartered in uh, Silicon Valley and, um, uh, and Seattle. Um, and everybody else, Everybody else uh, online that sells advertising is left, you know, fighting for the scraps. Uh, so, um, what I um, what I what I want to sort of take away from this is, um, you know, the the idea of these two different uh, directions that, uh, that digital media is taking us, uh, you know, toward the, the illusion of certainty. Who knows about Porta, you know, maybe, maybe it'll work. Um, but um, certainly the advertising uh, doesn't work and there's a uh, increasing, um, you know, sort of backlash against it uh, to the, um, which if you follow the, um, uh, stock market and the performance of Facebook, you will have noticed that they uh, had a very precipitous drop last week. Um, and, you know, precisely for, for this reason. Um, but, um, uh, you know, so there's that, uh, which perhaps is uh, going to be in abeyance, you know, ever since the publication of Shoshana uh, Zuboff's book, uh, about the surveillance economy, uh, you know, that's become a buzzword. People understand now that, uh, uh, you know, that we are being watched um, and there's beginning to be a pretty serious reaction against it. So there's that. And on the other hand, there's this, um, there's this sort of desire to um, eliminate uh, or certainly at least blur the boundary between what's real and what's not real, um, which we see in entertainment, which we see in news, which we certainly see in politics, and which, you know, I would suggest has 
um, very dangerous um, possibilities. Um, but um, there's also, I think there's a way out of that as well. There's a, you know, there's a sense in which digital media doesn't have to be about the blur. Um, you know, the blur is, um, is, is appealing to us in a way because it's sort of unknown. We don't really understand it. We don't really know where it's going to take us. Um, but we, uh, so there's this uh, uh, desire perhaps to, to just sort of follow it and see where it goes. Um, but there's a countervailing desire to uh, like, let's get back to something that's real that we can um, touch and hold on to. Um, and, you know, uh, about a week or 10 days ago, I, I published a piece in the Times on uh, David Byrne, the uh, lead singer from, ex-lead singer from Talking Heads, who um, on the occasion of an art show that he had at the Pace Gallery in, uh, in Chelsea. And um, one of the things that we talked about, which didn't really make it into the article because it wasn't, um, you know, terribly relevant to the subject, was this online magazine that he had started with uh, a story called Reasons to be Cheerful. It was mentioned in the article, but we, I didn't go into it in any detail. Um, and Reasons to be Cheerful is, uh, you know, something that he started about, uh, I think, three years ago. And on the name of it, from the name of it, it sounds like one of those, you know, good news newspapers that people are always you know, agitating for. Why are the newspapers always filled with bad news? Well, the reason the newspapers are filled with bad news is because that's what's unusual. Uh, you know, if you think about it, uh, if, you know, the, the good news newspapers, most of them want to, you know, run stories about, uh, you know, little Timmy and his, you know, third year birthday and, you know, how sweet it was and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, um, so, that's fine, but if we um, lived in a world in which that was the um, exception um, rather than the rule, um, we wouldn't be very happy at all. Um, so <laughs> I'm very suspicious of good news newspapers. But um, David's idea was actually um, different from that. He had a very interesting twist on it. Um, he, uh, reasons to be cheerful in his view was um, stories that showed how people were, are working together to actually do something, accomplish something, uh, you know, do something good. Uh, and so there's a practical aspect to all of the stories. It's not just, you know, a, a sort of a sappy feel good thing. It's um, stuff that actually happens and works and that people are doing. Um, he himself wrote a story recently about an initiative in Christchurch in, in uh, New Zealand um, to, uh, they wanted to encourage people to recycle, you know, to like uh, sort their garbage and stuff so that uh, some of it could be um, recycled. Um, and they had like a not quite 50% participation rate. So they're trying to figure out what to do. Other cities have done things like, uh, you know, pay people to, um, uh, you know, take your, to, to, to recycle their stuff, uh, or to um, fine you if you, um, you know, don't meet a certain uh, quota. Uh, neither one of those are good. The, the, the fine idea is like, oh, okay, that means I can get away with it if I, you know, like don't do, uh, you know, only a certain amount, uh, and the and the idea of paying people is even worse. It's sort of like it turns it into a transactional relationship, um, which is which is not good at all. So what they did was they actually gave people stickers to put on their um, you know garbage cans uh, if they were complying with the uh, you know recycling um, goals, and that was very successful. It, you know, almost. Uh, close to double the um, rate of participation. And it um, uh, obviously by appearing in, uh, you know, online, the story could, you know, inspire other people elsewhere in other cities to do the same sort of thing. 
there was another story about a um, community safety partnership uh, in, with the LAPD, um, a um, police force that has not been known for its, um, um, you know, uh, sort of being nice to the community. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the article had um, stuff about, um, the, you know, police officers in walks, um, uh, you know, working with kids. And as a result, kids are playing in, uh, you know, areas where uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, it was, uh, you know, gangland shootouts. Um, so, you know, these are kind of the, the benefits that you can get from, uh, you know, from a, an approach to news, I guess you should say, that looks at, uh, you know, as, as David's organization does, um, that looks at what can be done, you know, and what is being done, uh, more importantly. Um, now, he told me, um, uh, you know, when he started this, I thought, uh, do you think we're going to run out of stories in a month? Um, and uh, uh, they still have. So uh, that's what I want to um, close with. Um, the idea that, um, yes, there are a lot of uh, ominous signals out there, um, but there's also a great deal of noise. And uh, one thing that we have to do um, as we, uh, you know, learn to navigate the sort of digital media landscape is not to mistake the noise for a signal. Thank you. I was tickled that you mentioned William Goldman, who, and I'm right about this, was a member of this library and also, I think, a, a screenwriter and author beloved of many of us. And thinking of his classic, The Princess Bride, um, <laughs> it's of course successful, partly because it tells a recognizable set of tropes of romance, swashbuckler, fairy tale, etc. And partly because it turns those tropes on their head and does all kinds of unexpected and funny things with them. You were talking about the balance of novelty versus known items. In stories told in public, can you talk a little bit about how that works within a story? And also why some of the ones that kind of go viral as personal narratives even, or as you know, published narratives, how that works. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. And I think, um, uh, I mean, I was, I was really um, impressed with, with what um, uh, Eve had to say about, you know, his, his quantitative theory of interestingness especially the Philip Glass observation. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, you know, we, we, we don't like stories. If you think about, you know, a novel you're reading or a television show or a movie, we don't like stories where we can tell where it's going to go. You know, we, we, we want it to, we want some surprises. And God forbid somebody should, you know, utter a spoiler. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I think that's what's, uh, I think that's what is at issue here. I think that we, um, we, we want to, um, you know, be surprised, but we want to be surprised within a certain, um, you know, a, a certain measure, you know, a certain degree. We don't want too much surprise. And, you know, some years ago when I was at Wired, I, I interviewed uh, Jonathan Lethem about um, Philip K. Dick because Lethem had um, uh, edited the first volume of what turned out to be three of Philip K. Dick novels to be published by uh, the Library of America. In other words, he was being ushered into the canon of literature. Uh, by none other than Jonathan Lethem, who had been a huge fan of his as a kid. Uh, and, uh, you know, to the point that when he got out of school, he, uh, uh, even though, you know, Dick had just died, this was in, uh, I think, the late 70s or very early 80s, um, he still, you know, went to Berkeley. He said it was like a, he was like a chicken with a head cut off and his feet just took him to Berkeley. Uh, and he, he went to the, you know, to the stories where, you know, Dick had bought stuff and things like that. Um, but his, um, you know, the, the 
um, thing that he uh, was trying to, one thing that he was trying to get across was we were talking about uh, Dick's early science fiction uh, in the 50s, and he wrote a lot of short stories and a couple of novels, which uh, the novels especially, uh, Levin said, you know, God help you if you stumble across one of them, thinking it's going to be one of his great works. Uh, and and what was, uh, you know, what was um, happening? What the reason he explained that uh, this was happening with with Dick and his works was that uh, he was trying to. Uh, you know, make money by, you know, writing science fiction stories, which by the way, you got to pay about $200 for. Um, and, um, uh, but at the same time, he was, he had this, these literary ambitions and he wanted to, um, you know, be taken seriously as a novelist and short story writer. So he was writing these, these um, other types of works entirely uh, that, um, failed because, as Latham put it, um, you know, you couldn't uh, explain his, you know, a, a character sort of, you know, suburban ennui uh, by, uh, you know, having his, having him have some sort of cosmic breakdown in the, you know, in the middle of the story. Uh, it was, um, you know, it just didn't work. And that's kind of what I'm talking about here, this, you know, you have to, uh, say something that is not entirely unexpected. You know, there's a there's there's parameters on where a story can go, uh, and I think um, I think that's what's at issue here. Yes. This is perhaps more an observation or a comment, but it was Norman Jewison who said it's all about stories. And if you think about something like Jesus Christ Superstar, his adaptations, but also were an interesting, in some cases, twist or take or nuanced version of the regular story. Right, right, yes, indeed. And, and her stories were <laughs> yeah, wonderful and precisely that way. Yes? I've done way too much reading about Eve over the, over the last year. So you've actually met Eve. Is, is he one of the great storytellers you've ever met? Eve uh, Berkowitz? Right. Uh huh. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say that, but he, he was pretty entertaining. He was a great interview. Uh, <laughs> you know. I asked him because the story is so compelling when he's come clean about his past. Right, right. Nobody seems to care, not USC, not anybody. Nobody cares about his past, not the chairman of this. They don't care. Like, he's great. It's like they, you read him to be a great storyteller. He must be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, he. He um, sort of broke this news to me uh, shortly after an article had come out in the Hollywood Reporter about him. You know, sort of, as you probably know, uh, there, there was sort of an expose in, um, uh, I think it was 2019 or so, uh, where, you know, somebody broke the story. Nobody, you know, uh, except I guess his family and friends really knew it before. Uh, and, um, uh, and certainly, <laughs> it didn't bother me, um, you know. But uh, but I wasn't uh, USC. Uh, but it didn't bother uh, his colleagues there either. Clearly, um, they were, uh, you know. I think he was uh, understandably worried, but um, there was a remarkably little fallout. I think we might need one or two more questions if others have them from the audience, or I can throw in another from here. Okay. Um, so I think I'm drawing this notion from Ellie Wiesel. Somebody correct me if you know better, but I think he tells a story about successive generations of rabbis who go to a certain place in the forest and perform a ritual and sing a song, and as the generations pass, the lore of how to do this is gradually lost. So the first generation does the ritual and sings the song, and the second generation doesn't know the ritual anymore, but can sing the song. And by the later generation, the guy says, I'm sorry, Lord, I can go to the place, but I don't know the ritual, and I don't know the song, but I can tell the story. And God replies, that's okay, I made humans because I love stories. <laughs> and, you know, which is a beautiful sentiment, but it gets me thinking about 
and I'm going to dismiss it as genuinely beautiful sentiment, but it gets me thinking about stories as ritual, repetition, identity, continuity of community in a very different way. Your cousin reading from the family will, reiterating, here's a story of our family. I mean, it's positive right. and it's negative. Can you talk a little bit about ritual, repetition, identity? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting story. I think that, I think the first thing to go is, uh, is, is not only the, you know, what you're supposed to do as part of the ritual, but why you're doing it. <laughs> yeah. It's like, after a while, it's just a ritual. And, you know, whatever we can remember what, uh, from the ritual is, uh, is, is whatever uh, is motivating us. And I think that um, happens to a remarkable extent uh, in cultures generally, uh, you know, in religions and nationalities and, uh, you know, regional, uh, you know, histories, um, you know, coming from the South, it's, uh, it's certainly, I mean, I, I, I read a story the other day that sort of, you know, wondered and, you know, frankly, didn't really answer the question of, you know, why are Southerners still, uh, you know, fighting over something or, you know, not literally fighting, of course, but, but you know, so upset about something that happened like, you know, nearly 200 years ago. Uh, so it's, it's really quite uh, odd, especially when you realize that there's been a huge amount of migration to the South from other parts of the country over the last, you know, 20 or 30 years in particular. And yet it doesn't seem to dilute this in the slightest. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I don't know, but, you know, I think we cling to rituals and, uh, and for the same reason, the stories behind them uh, because they're familiar, because they, you know, they give us something to hold on to. And I think that's the, you know, that's sort of the point of stories um, uh, to begin with. And in certain cases, it becomes, you know, really extreme. Thank you. Any more questions? Happy to uh, rattle on at length. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.